So to introduce myself, my name is Stephanie Yamas. I work at Superdata. We were acquired by Nielsen last September. So we have been building out a lot of really cool stuff since our acquisition. Um, I head our XR research and strategy. And so um, you can get a hold of me through my Twitter handle. It's usually the easiest. Um, and then you can email me at stephanie.yamas at nielsen.com. So just quickly to give you some background on where this data actually comes from. Uh, we create products that cover the market and give you an inside look at what the trends will look like over the next few years, as well as consumer reporting insights. So we give you a 360 view on both the consumer and the enterprise side of XR through MR, AR, mobile AR, and VR. And we're proud to partner up with VR and AR companies who provide us data through our XR data network. Our XR data network uses this data to inform the estimates that we create so that we're based on factual data and we're able to model out an accurate market. So again, please visit our website or send me an email if you're interested. So I wanna get started with maybe a bigger picture that we can use to understand where the market is going and why we think what we think, and why we know what we know. So the main thing that I always like to point out is color TVs. I see this technology as being not the next color TV necessarily, but has some of the, the patterns of what happened to the color TV when it was first introduced. So color TVs had an advantage in that you were able to see the capabilities through a store window, which is great. And that's something that you can kind of see with AR on your mobile devices, which is a big reason why mobile AR has been growing so quickly and has, and has so much short-term opportunity. But um, VR is a little bit different. And so we're kind of at a color TV moment with VR, except for we don't have the storefront windows. You have to kind of be in a headset and experience VR to really understand what it's all about. And so I'm sure, I, I hope everyone in this room has tried VR and you kind of can get a sense of what it's like to describe this to your friends and family. It's very difficult and it's not something that you can kind of do in passing. So a big challenge of virtual reality is the fact that consumers need to be very proactive in their desire to try it and understand it. Whereas in the past, a lot of these different technologies that grew, grew much quicker than we anticipate VR to grow because they were accessible without having to go and try something very specific and very insular. So one thing though that I do want to kind of point out as being really interesting is that VR is on that trajectory and it is on the color TV trajectory. And so VR is doing something similar in that it is adding to media consumption that we already use. It's giving you an enhanced experience the way color TV did um, with black and white TV. And so we see a very slow growth for VR, but we do see an inflection point coming in the next five to 10 years. Now mobile AR you can see is growing much faster. And this is in reference to Households that have accessed mobile AR in uh, 2018 at least once. So at least once, um, roughly 65% of American households accessed AR on their mobile phone in um, the last year. So that means that mobile AR, I think we all understand, is going to be hugely accessible to the short-term market. Will it go beyond that? we kind of have to wait and see what kind of sophisticated capabilities and content we'll see as phones become more sophisticated and have better capabilities. Um, but it, in the meantime, it's very accessible, it's very easy to use. One of the challenges that I'll talk about in just a second though is monetization. And this is something that actually affects both virtual and augmented reality. And so this gives you a sense of what the market looks like over the next few years. And as you can see, there is, if you compare this to other media, it's 
not huge in terms of the share of media consumption and the amount of revenue that people spend versus the amount of um, money that is going into VR and AR. So to give you some context, the uh, gaming video content uh, market, you know, so any videos that are monetized through gaming content, um, eSports and games all reach almost $100 billion uh, reached in 2018. So this is clearly like nowhere near that. It's going to take quite a bit of time. And something that you can see is that in virtual reality, the bulk of the sales and revenue come from hardware. The reason being there's no clear monetization model for the virtual reality software market. So one of the biggest challenges is that there's no long tail, which means that if you create content, you'll sell that content once and then it's very difficult to add additional content that people will actually buy over time to give yourself a longer tail of monetization opportunity. In the mobile augmented reality space, there's also a monetization challenge in that people kind of expect free filters or a lot of these things are indirect ROI, like retail augmented reality. So the bulk of that number actually comes from Pokemon Go, because that's one of the only things that has a long tail opportunity for growth and monetization. But we see in 2022, the market tripling. Um, so we do see a lot of opportunity over the next few years as we, uh, as we see more opportunity for monetization, as we see more people in headsets, more phones accessing AR, and more AR-capable um, applications finding ways to make money. So as I mentioned, we're kind of at the point of an inflection point. So by 2022, we'll kind of see a jump start up. And that's where we're going to see some of the trends, you know, in terms of adoption, that kind of growth pattern, we'll see in terms of revenue for virtual reality. So this is just virtual reality from 2019 to 2022. And so revenue this year will grow 48 percent, or actually over 50 percent from last year, and then year to year through next year over uh, almost 50 percent. So we're seeing really healthy growth in the market, even though it does feel a little slow. And it's not a huge number, like I mentioned before, but it does show that there is opportunity. And I'll talk a little bit about where that opportunity is in just a moment. But why? Are we inhibited from growth, right? So aside from monetization, cost of headsets. So this is going toward the positive side in that you're starting to see headsets that are much more affordable, particularly standalone headsets. So you don't need a PC rig, you don't need a console to start up an Oculus Go or an Oculus Quest. And this is the direction that we're starting to see the trends for um, the growth of virtual reality. The content diversity is a positive in that we're starting to see more of it, but we're still not there. And discoverability is a huge, huge challenge for virtual reality, on top of the fact that a lot of these experiences are very short. And so when you're charging $50, $60 for an experience, people expect a long experience. And so something that actually has been a great trend is something like Beat Saber. Beat Saber you can continue to enjoy over time, and that gives you a return on your investment as a consumer that feels valuable. We're starting to see that kind of content grow and that ability to grow the market as well. And then location-based VR is very important. We've started to see a lot of location-based VR crop up across the world, and our research has shown that a lot of these location-based um, venues are doing so well that they actually have really a really difficult time getting everyone through the experience. So it's not for lack of interest. Um, sometimes that revenue can cap off because it's just very hard to get through people quickly. Um, so that's something that, again, is a challenge and is an opportunity. So looking at VR headset shipments, one of the things that I want to point out that I think is the most obvious point is that standalone VR headsets are the future. We absolutely believe that standalone is where consumer headset sales will grow the highest. Enterprise is a bit of a different animal because there definitely will always be a need for 
extra high-powered devices that consumers don't necessarily need, but on the enterprise are important. But for consumers, standalone devices that are affordable are the future. Oculus Go shipped about a million devices last year. It's on, on uh, track to ship roughly the same this year. And Oculus Quest, we imagine, will, will sell about the same this year as well. It's highly affordable if you consider the price of PC um, VR. So not having to buy supporting hardware, just spending the four, $400 up front and then that's it. Uh, the Oculus Go also gives a great opportunity because it's even cheaper and it's very accessible. And these two headsets, I know some people are a little extra critical, but I think in terms of what consumers are expecting, they're fantastic. They solve the problem and they give consumers what they want in a very easy to use headset. So that's where we really see the future going. Now on the software side, in 2019, software came in at about $1.4 billion, again inhibited by monetization opportunity. So that's why you see almost half of monetization coming in from games, which are the most monetizable experiences and the most lucrative out there. And that's where you're also seeing huge games grow as a, a large piece of the market. So I mentioned Beat Saber. I think that's the best example. It's a great game. It's something that's easy to access and it's making a good amount of money. And so you're starting to see these bigger games come in and make good money, but just a few. So again, discoverability can be difficult, but it is pushing forward. These larger revenue streams are pushing forward the market. And then location-based VR again, huge opportunity, really growing the market and really excited for its future. So when we look at 2022, um, we see that games will continue to grow and be the largest segment. The reason why is because VR in the short term is for gamers, okay? It's because content delivery for other media types is still not there. There's no reason for people right now to leave their television for virtual reality. It's just not, the experience is just not there yet, right? It's not to say that it won't happen, but it still is going to take time. Whereas games, clear opportunity, the highest spenders on new, uh, new media equipment. So we find that gamers spend more than non-gamers on new equipment like televisions or PCs or new media and technology like virtual reality. So games will be where virtual reality really finds its consumer base and then location-based VR will continue to grow or will be 20%, but it will continue to grow just at a smaller share. Interactive media, I wanna point out, because interactive media is sort of a new media type that we're seeing through virtual reality. So these are semi-gamified experiences that don't have a clear goal at the end the way games do, but they have some kind of uh, gamification. Tilt Brush, I think, is the, the best example. It's something that's fun, it's easy to use, it's great to, to it's really accessible, um, but it's not quite a game, it's an interactive uh, experience. So we're going to see more of these experiences come into play, and I think part of what's so difficult to imagine what the future is going to look like is the fact that we don't know how amazing innovation will be in two, five, ten years. I don't think we could imagine where we were, where we would, where we would be now, at the first AWE, right? We are seeing this market and the innovation around it grow at such an enormous and fast rate that it's impossible to know what folks like you are gonna come up with in the next few years. So based on what we see in terms of market patterns, based on what we see in terms of the historical media landscape and what we're seeing in terms of opportunity for monetization, growth and adoption, this is where we see the market going in the short term. In the long term, we see huge amounts of innovation and we see really exciting things for virtual reality. Virtual reality is not the only opportunity. So going back to mobile augmented reality, we see mobile AR users growing up to almost 2 billion users in 2020. That means 
folks who access at least once an AR application and use the AR capabilities. That's huge. So um, that means, and as Ori showed earlier, we're at about a billion, right? And that's growing fairly quickly. As we're seeing more of these capable, uh, these capable devices go into the market, but also really interesting applications. So I talk about retail a lot because the first thing is, because that's the one I actually use the most. Um, I'm a huge fan of makeup and Sephora. Sephora has an amazing overlay. Same thing for Snapchat. I was literally Snapchatting my mom this morning what I would look like as a, as a little kid and as a man, and it was really creepy. Um, but really interesting and exciting to see what kinds of things and what innovation is going into this. And so when we think about what's most popular among consumers, really obviously right now we see an opportunity for social media applications because that's just where we're seeing the most usage. TikTok, Snapchat, and so on are providing people with opportunities to discover and use AR most easily. But we also, again, see retail apps as being a huge opportunity, opportunity point for people to use AR in a way that they're not necessarily looking for it. So going back to the proactivity of a VR user uh, using it for the first time, you don't need that for mobile AR. Again, I sent my mom a picture this morning that showed AR, and she thought it was so cool that she downloaded Snapchat, and she's been texting me all morning. So, this is a lot easier, and this is almost your color TV for XR, in that you can see it through the window, but you can see it through the window of your phone. And then AR games are an opportunity, but AR games are a little bit less uh, accessible for users, in that they're difficult to discover, and not a lot of users on mobile devices are very hardcore gamers, are you know, looking for new ways to game. A lot of them are casual, and so it's a little less popular in that respect. So to go back to the main point, we're seeing that over the next few years, there will be a lot of growth. VR will continue to grow at a fast rate through hardware. Hardware is costly. So it's the most expensive part of virtual reality. Um, and it's also your entry point. You have to have the hardware to be able to experience the software. So that's where a lot of this is coming, is coming from. And then um, one thing I want to point out is that it's very difficult to kind of segment out enterprise and consumer headsets. It's something that we do. Um, but in this graph, you're kind of seeing them together. So it does say consumer revenue, but we're thinking about consumer consumption in terms of hardware because it is hard to parse those things out. So that's why mobile, or sorry, that's why mixed reality and augmented reality headsets um, are growing at such a rapid rate over the next few years as we start to see things like Google Glass come into play or possibly an Apple uh, product come in over the next couple of years. And then obviously you have HoloLens and Magic Leap, which have um, already penetrated the enterprise market. So that's where you're going to see the bulk of that um, revenue come from. But mobile AR will kind of find its revenue legs in the next few years. We'll see a lot of good growth for that. We'll see, um, we've already seen software revenue for mobile AR surpass VR. And then overall, a tripling of the market. So thank you so much. <laughs>